President John F. Kennedy PowerPoint Keynote Inaugural Address It is time in short for a new generation of leadership. All over the world, particularly in the newer nations, young men are coming to power. Men who are not bound by the traditions of the past. Men who are not blinded by the old fears and hates and rivalries. Heavy snow fell the night before the inauguration, but thoughts about cancelling the plans were overruled. John F. Kennedy won the popular vote by a slim margin of approximately 100,000 votes. Richard Nixon won more individual states than Kennedy but it was Kennedy who prevailed by winning key states with many electoral votes. He attended Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Georgetown that morning before joining President Eisenhower to travel to the Capitol. The Congress had extended the East Front, and the inaugural platform spanned the new edition. The oath of office was administered by Chief Justice Earl Warren. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Robert Frost was supposed to read one of his poems called Dedication, at the ceremony. When he stood to recite the poem, the wind and the bright reflection of sunlight, off new fallen snow, made reading the poem impossible. He was able, however, to recite the gift outright, from memory. The land was ours before we were the land. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possess. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found out that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war to the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. President Kennedy's commentary on Robert Frost poetry I asked Robert Frost to come and speak at the inauguration because I felt he had something important to say to those of us who were occupied with the business of government. That he would remind us that we were dealing with life, the hopes and fears of millions of people. He has said it well in a poem called Choose Something Like a Star, in which he speaks of the fairest star in sight and says, it asks little of us here, it asks of us a certain height. So when at times the mob is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we may choose something like a star, stay our mind on, and be stayed.
We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. To our sister republics, south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words 
in a good deed. In a new alliance for progress to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. <laughs> to that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction, unleashed by science, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. We dare not tempt them with weakness, for only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. But neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course, both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons, both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom, yet both racing to alter that uncertain balance of terror that stays the hand of mankind's final war. So let us begin anew. Remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. Let both sides for the first time formulate serious and precise proposals for the inspection and control of arms and bring the absolute power to destroy other nations under the absolute control of all nations. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depth, and encourage the arts and commerce. Let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. And if a beachhead of cooperation may push back the jungle of suspicion, let both sides join in creating a new endeavor, not a new balance of power, but a new world of law where the strong are just and the weak secure and the peace preserved. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, 
nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. John F. Kennedy settles into office as the 35th President of the United States, the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic ever elected to the office. The first president born in the 20th century, he comes to office after one of the narrowest elections in American history. At 43 years of age, Mr. Kennedy takes over the power that for eight years has been vested in Dwight D. Eisenhower, who at 70 was the oldest occupant of the White House. Inauguration Day dawns on a capital that had been almost paralyzed by a full blizzard. Italians of snowfighters kept Pennsylvania Avenue clear for the square. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Nixon are present at the conclusion to one of the best managed transitions of power on record.
Despite tough freezing temperatures, hundreds of thousands watched the ceremonies in front of the Capitol as the new president and vice president, Lyndon Johnson, assume office. Slippery streets and stall traffic cause a delay in the swearing-in ceremonies, a delay which the president and his predecessor pass in serious conversation. Then Lyndon Baines Johnson is sworn in as vice president by fellow Texan, Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. The first time, incidentally, a Speaker of the House of Representatives has administered the oath of office to a vice president. Then, ten minutes later, John Fitzgerald Kennedy is sworn by Chief Justice Warren as the 35th President of the United States, with the prayers of four major faiths to support him in office. Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Mr. Nixon and Mr. Eisenhower are quick to extend their congratulations. President Kennedy's speech is brief and stirring. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. A significant portion is addressed to Latin America. To our sister republics, south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds, in a new alliance for progress, to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. About a half hour behind schedule, the official party lunches in the Capitol, where the others chat as Mr. Kennedy's meal is interrupted to sign the papers formally nominating his cabinet. Then the procession to the White House and the reviewing stand for the inauguration parade. En route to their new address, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, John and Jacqueline Kennedy are cheered by nearly a million the presiding dignitaries review a vast and impressive array of military units, bands, and drill teams. A three and a half hour march. Head of the parade, a replica of a Navy PT boat, like that commanded by President Kennedy in the Pacific in World War II, with most of his crew on hand. A stirring but chilled review in the freezing weather. That night, things warm up. After a brief rest, President Kennedy and the First Lady venture from the White House to attend a round of no less than five gala inaugural balls. The presidential couple arrive at the main ball at the Columbia Armory, Washington's resplendent finale to two and a half days of celebration. A new era begins under the leadership of President John F. Kennedy.